recording. Hello and welcome to the Sisters in Stoke podcast. I am super pumped to be joined today by Kate Gordon. Kate Gordon is a CrossFit coach. She was a team competitor for CrossFit at the Games in 2015-2019. She has been a CrossFit seminar staff wearing one of the coveted red shirts since 2014. She is the owner of CFK Nutrition, CFK Programming, and she is also a podcast host of the Gone Rogue podcast, which discusses non-monogamy and lots of other things as well. She's originally from New Zealand, but has made her way to Newcastle via LA, Brisbane, and Melbourne. Kate Gordon, welcome to the podcast, and tell me, what are you stoked about? <laughs> Hello, welcome. Hello. Welcome. I don't know why I'm saying welcome. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for Hi. the welcome. um to be honest right now I'm probably just stoked for the change of season it's getting really warm and sunny and it's just like beautiful blue sky here at the moment so I'm pretty stoked on that yeah and that's probably uh that's a good sign that you made the right decision by leaving Melbourne and moving (laughs) to Newcastle I know people here are sad that you did that but it's been like freezing cold I had to scrape ice off my car last week so yeah, I, I don't miss Melbourne. I thought I might. I've always been a city girl. Like I've always lived in a big city. Um, So Newcastle is the first time I've lived somewhere small. I mean, it's still Newcastle is, I think, the biggest regional town in Australia. So it's not that small, but um, I've been loving it. You miss the coffee? No regrets. Coffee? Sure. Gra- yeah, no, coffee here is great. There's great <sighs> coffee in restaurants and things. Yeah, that's, that's like, that's the thing that people always talk about when they leave Melbourne. They're like, oh, I miss the coffee because we are coffee snobs here, but I'm just a caffeine person. And you actually don't drink that much coffee, do you? No, I have decaf, which can actually make getting good coffee even harder. But um, yeah. no, I have some really reliable, amazing uh, coffee shops in Newcastle, which is awesome. Good, good. Um, I actually wanted to just start by reading a recent post of yours from Instagram mm because it very much sums up why I've asked you to be here on the podcast today. So for those of, for the people that are listening and and watching this, who know me, they will know that I am not a CrossFitter. I don't identify myself that way. Um, I've done CrossFit. I loved it for a long time. We can talk about why people are hesitant to say, oh, I'm an athlete or I'm this or I'm that. Um, But I have followed you for a long time. And, you know, I think people have said to you before, they come for the CrossFit and they stay for the sex. Um, Or, you know, I came for the powerlifting and stayed for the pleasure talk. Because something that really strikes me is that you cover a very holistic approach to wellness, which is there's no point in eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and training well, if you're not actually going to enjoy your experience in this life. And something Mm -hmm. else about you in particular that I have always found so amazing in terms of your content is that For me as an individual, you really hit that very, very sweet spot between being compassionate, recognizing people's challenges, understanding people's fears and being able to speak to that. And then also calling me on my own bullshit and being able to say to people, you know, I saw that coach Steph did a post this morning saying that you'd said to her, fuck Mm. your feelings, Um, which sounds so harsh, but it's not. (laughs) <laughs> and that's what I want to talk about. But I just want to start by reading this post. This is just from a few days ago. And uh, you've been dealing with an injury as you're training for the Torian Pro. So you'd put out that you wanted to compete as an individual next year in the Torian Pro. Uh, and you've been working through this injury, which is how it always seems to go sometimes for people. It can be very frustrating. When I first made this goal, it was because I didn't want to be the person that leaned into self-doubt. I didn't know if I was going to be capable of doing it again, but I was more afraid of being the kind of person that just didn't try. The goal was a challenge to be better. Having an injury is scary, not just because this is the only body I have for the rest of my life, but because it gives you an easy out. It would be reasonable for me to abort mission and walk away from this scary goal. So while I adjusted my expectations, I decided I wouldn't give up on the possibility of it still happening. The biggest thing was removing the pressure and this idea that I needed more time than I had. I knew that I would start feeling like I was disadvantaged, like it wasn't fair or that it was just plain too late. But all those thoughts exist only in my head. They are projections of my fears. But I'm not a fortune teller. I don't know what the future holds. So making decisions about my goals based on what I think, aka my fears, would be making decisions based on assumptions. The reality is I don't know. I might be disadvantaged, but I might not. 
It might not be fair, but that could be irrelevant. It might be too late, but it could be the exact amount of time that I need. I actually don't know. When I separate the facts from the story, I quickly identify my self-limiting beliefs. All I'm really saying is that I'm still in the fight. I'm going to give it hell and see what I'm capable of. I have a feeling you're going to do very well. But my question for you <laughs> based on that is when someone reads that, that's an incredible mindset to have that ability to deal with adversity. Have you always been like that? Or has that been a process for you to get to this place where you're able to have that kind of perspective? I've always been like that. Uh, no, that's bullshit. I have not always been like that. <laughs> no, not at all. Far from it. Um, CrossFit's been a pretty, like a bit of a gift for me in terms of adversity and mindset and um, just mental fortitude. I think it's yeah. taught me to be competitive in a way that isn't about being scared to lose. It's taught me to be competitive in a way that's about being willing to look like a full and try even if I fail, you know, that's been something that has been the gift and it's applied to all the other areas of my life because of that. So, um, yeah, I think it's one of those things where I wanted to be more competitive and was lucky to be around some really intelligent people who were great mentors to me, um, and gave me access to people who knew a lot of, about mindset and put me onto, um, psychologists, authors, podcasters, you know, life coaches, all these incredible people that have slowly over time influenced me. Um, and CrossFit is like any kind of physical training becomes a vehicle for you to practice a lot of those mindset tools. Um, now you can do it in everyday life as well. Of course, there's so many challenges that we're faced with, but daily training in a gym where you're daily taking on some kind of adversity or challenge that's physically hard, <laughs> um, is a really nice it's way to practice hard. this thing. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I learned how to identify the story and like the, the story that I was telling myself and the reality, um, maybe a few years ago, and it's been an ongoing practice that I've had to learn. And I still, you know, sometimes in the moment struggle to do it, but can in within, uh, you know, potentially reflecting on the day at the end of the day, I can pull apart what happened and how I reacted and, and assess whether it was the kind of reaction I want or not. Yeah. So I'm, I'm getting better at it. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly was not a skill that I was born with. Um, absolutely not. Um, or though I will say that I probably learned a fairly good work ethic from my parents, um, and upbringing and like just being active and not being afraid of learning new things. Mm -hmm. So I think there probably was to a degree, a willingness to, um, maybe be, be a student, you know, to a degree. So I think that that certainly helps. Yeah. And I do think that that, I mean, as someone who works with women, mostly in midlife, and a lot of them come to me seeking, like, you know, they basically want to be able to make an ass of themselves, you know, like they have all this fear that's holding them back from either trying new things or from cutting their hair or from asking for a divorce, like whatever the context of it actually is. And I think to some extent that skill can be really inherent, that ability to be a student, to be curious, um, to be willing to explore. And I think CrossFit, as you said, the reason I am so such an advocate for women to get involved in strength sports in particular is because it is humbling. And mm. no matter how fit you get, quote unquote fit, and I'm using air quotes because that, that term fit can mean a lot of different things. Because of the way we scale strength sports, it's you're always there to challenge yourself. That is the goal of the workout is to tear yourself down a little bit to build yourself back up. And so you know, in the years that I was doing CrossFit, there was workouts I would get excited about, but there was certainly never a workout that was easy. And so knowing every day, and for me, being able to embrace that and to learn to show up tired and to show up when I was frustrated or I had my period or I was this or I was that, and to cut myself a little bit of slack, but not too much, I think was the real gift of that. So now you talked about your parents and that work ethic. So you were born and raised in New Zealand? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. And you have a background in dance. Is that correct? Yeah, that was kind of my sport as a kid, if you call it a sport. Um, I do. I mean, I was active <laughs> anyway. Like I was I was skiing every winter on the mountain. My dad's a big skier. And yep. then we'd always be at the beach in summer, like behind the boat doing some kind of activity. So we were, we were pretty active in general. Um, and I did a little bit of little bit of martial arts and gymnastics when I was maybe like 10, 11, 12, but then was just in love with dance. And uh, that was kind of what I was pretty committed to for about 12 or 13 years through high school. Do you still dance now? 
Uh, only on the dance floor at a like bar or a club. <laughs> yeah, I still choreograph occasionally. Yeah, yeah. Myself. Yeah, there's there's been a couple of dance schools that I've dropped into over the years, but um, I I really do find that CrossFit is quite a, an amazing outlet for me, especially because there is so much skill involved. Like there's there's a lot of coordination and body awareness that kind of goes into some of the stuff yeah. that I do. So yeah, I, I, I yeah I've kind of diverted away from dance, but not away from the skills that are required to be a good dancer. Yep. Now you have also spoken very openly about, and this is another reason that I really followed you, your struggles with body image and eating disorders over the years, um, Mm. which started quite early. Was that for you? Do you think that came from being a dancer? I mean, it does for a lot of people, but not for everyone. Was that a pressure that you felt within that community? No, funnily enough, I was lucky with the dance school that I was at. She yeah. really avoided competition, which ironically is now what I do a lot of, um, <laughs> not with dance, obviously. But so she wanted to create a studio. And I, at the time, I wasn't I wasn't really aware of why. But uh, the studio that I was at was created deliberately to not compete. She didn't want people to compete. She didn't want that to be why people dance. She didn't like the environment. I believe she'd had some negative experiences. It had been really toxic, um, which, you know, doesn't surprise me one bit. Like you get a bunch of young girls together and yeah. trying to like win something. And it's based on how you look, you know, like I, I know that dancing is a form of movement, but it is people looking at you. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that there were a lot of health, unhealthy things that she'd experienced. So she was trying to not repeat that uh and I was lucky enough to be at her studio so no none of the pressure to look a certain way came from dance um I think if anything it probably just came from media like people around me um I never it's funny I never you know it's you know when you when you try to think back to it maybe it's a lack of memory thing like I've just forgotten what what I was thinking at the time but I think a lot of it was not feeling like I had any kind of issue with my body or I was lacking something or it was that it could be better. You know, it was like, if you read the front of a magazine, which like, you know, when I was a kid, it was like, everybody got magazines all the time. Like there was the woman's day, there was cosmopolitan, there was girlfriend, I think like, you know, there's all those girls magazines. Um, And even some of the like slightly older age magazines would always be like, need to lose five pounds, like, or what do you do when you need to like lean, like get skinny or like, what about that hourglass figure? And so it was like, it wasn't that I felt like I was being told that there was something wrong with me or I ever had messaging that I wasn't enough. It was that there were ways to improve and you could do that via your body. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I think magazines actually have a lot to answer for in terms of Mm. our generation in some ways you're obviously younger than I am but that was like the highlight of my month was when the new magazines would come into the the chemist and I would take my pocket money and then I would go home and I would lay on my bed and I would read these articles about how to lose weight while I binge ate right so there's like the shame I'd be like shoving my feelings down knowing in some way that my body was probably never going to look like that you know, and now, now in my forties, I'm like, my body possibly could look like that, but I'm actually not willing to make the effort and, and give up certain things to make it look that way. And I'm, I'm okay with that decision. But I think the, uh, the insidiousness of the media, I've got a 13 year old son who considers himself to be a very, uh, savvy consumer of media. And I think he probably is more so than most because I worked in magazines for so long, but I can still see how it affects him. And when you look at now with social media and the filters and the, you know, even before we came on this call, I'm looking at the touch up my appearance and I'm like, oh, Botox, no Botox, Botox, no Botox. And I can like erase, (laughs) I can erase all my wrinkles and I can, you know, I can change this and I can change those things about myself and dealing with that pressure. And um, you did a post a while ago that, you know, you were at the beach and you were talking about all your flaws. And you were naming all those things that you see when you look at your body and I'm watching you and thinking like, I don't see those things, you know? Mm. And I think that's where social media has been such a powerful, positive place for people to share that inner dialogue because it starts to give people this perspective that, oh, that's not how other people see me. And it starts to make them a little bit more comfortable. Do you feel that pressure when you're on social media? Do you ever... Like, do you go down that rabbit hole? And if you do, how do you kind of pull yourself back out when you start to do that comparison thing? Um, Well, when I first started using things like social media, especially for, you know, Fitspo. Yeah. (laughs) 
Uh, it was like Tumblr and Pinterest yeah. and there were a lot of really unhealthy rabbit holes yeah. that you could go down on it's a those. lot of apps. But yeah, I, I will have to, I would say that some of that inspired me to get into like fitness and CrossFit at the same time. So it, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, right? It's like it, it did ultimately probably push me to go and start training. And I was yeah. lucky enough that I found mm. something that really focused on health as well as aesthetics and performance so there were goals that became more important than how you looked um in saying that it would have probably been quite easy easy for me to go the other way and become a figure competitor or you know like bikini yeah. bikini, whatever those different categories of bodybuilding are um so I I just kind of ended up going towards CrossFit and that fit me and fit my personality so yeah I think um there were definitely some good things but yeah, a hundred percent bad things. And one of the things that I did maybe, maybe four or five years ago on Instagram, that's the social media platform I use mostly is I basically unfollowed all the people that I used for motivation. Yeah. And when I say motivation, I think in my head at, at surface levels, I was like, Oh, just motivation to just be like fit in general. But all the girls that I was following for motivation were people that were absolutely shredded and posted all of their like bikini or like sports bra workout photos and videos. And I was like, this is actually not making me feel better. Like I'm not actually, I'm actually just feeling shame about not trying as hard with training or feeling like I, I should be doing more or feeling like I should look different. So really the motivation was just negative. It was just, it was just like, I would just feel bad. So yeah. I, I went and unfollowed a lot of those people. Um, and then, like you said, there's a lot of amazing people on social media that you can find. So social media is like that, right? It's like, there's just as many um, good people to follow as there are bad people and so many rabbit holes at off opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, but I went and followed a lot of people who have very body positive and represented different shaped bodies, different colored bodies, yeah. different able bodies. And when I diversified my feed, it really made social media a very different place for me. Um, and even to this day, like I'm pretty picky about who I follow and I can often feel concerned that I might come off as an asshole because I don't just follow everybody. Um, but I just try to kind of keep that a space that gives me things that feed me rather than starve me of good information. So um, yeah, I, diversifying my feed and, and being picky about who I follow and why I follow them is pretty important. Yeah. And I think that if you look at, if you look at people and who they follow, anyone I follow that has quite a large following as you do, they don't follow very many people. And I think that that is because if, if part of your job and part of your business is to be present in the social media space, then drawing that really hard boundary around who it is that you're going to let in. And it's, you know, I wouldn't let people come into my house and tell me, that I'm fat or I'm ugly or I'm this or I'm that. So why would I be following anybody who's insinuating that kind of thing on social media? And I've gotten really good at just thinking about those interactions online. Do I leave that interaction feeling better, feeling positive, feeling a little bit pumped, a bit hopeful? That being said, the flip side for me is that there are people I follow because they trigger me, because they challenge me. Yeah in a really tough way and even sometimes you know what we were talking about at the beginning uh, and that would feelings. be like opinion based though right like so absolutely like yeah I definitely agree with you in terms of like politics or ideals or beliefs <laughs> following people that are different to you is awesome yeah. um but uh yeah I think I just avoid anybody who yeah I guess it's like it's body image stuff right like a lot of that yeah. a lot of the time that I'm like ah oh, look at there's there's not really anything here for me and it's not that somebody is um, it, it doesn't even have to mean that they're actually trying to do something that makes it, it's me responding to them, which is what yeah. triggering is, right? When people are like, well, you're triggering me. And it's like, well, no, no, I'm triggered. I'm not doing anything. The trigger is a reflection of the shit that you've got going on in response to me. Um, so yeah, it, it's on me. It's like nobody, they don't even have to be doing anything. They can just be walking around in a sports bra and I think they've got better abs than me. And I'm like, oh, oh my God, how dare they? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, I follow a lot of, um, well, not as many anymore, but a lot of coaches that, you know, it's all photos of them in their bikini on the chaise lounge in Hawaii. I just had another $500,000 week and I'm like, fuck you. And then I'm like, why am I mad? Well, of course I'd like to be lying in a bikini making that kind of money. If they're making that kind of money, obviously that's a, that's a big, if sometimes <laughs> that's where yeah. I can look when I have any kind of that reaction, it's because there's a part of me that probably knows something about that to be true or I'm envious of it. And I've gotten really good mm. at identifying the difference between jealousy and envy and envy shows me where I can step up in my life. 
it shows me where I'm playing a bit small. It shows me where I know I have the capacity to be bigger and to be better, which is your mantra for next year, you know, be fucking better, do fucking better and just keep kind of working towards that goal. Do you ever find it challenging to straddle that space? And I don't know if it feels like it's a straddle to you between body positivity and also coaching people in nutrition and training who, you know, a lot of people have aesthetic goals. Does that ever, does that ever feel hard to you? Yeah. Yeah. It's been challenging to reconcile those two things. They kind of seem in in conflict with one another. Um, I think the thing that has helped me with addressing that is what I'm providing is hopefully a better way to do it. So, you know, I'm, I'm never going to take someone's bodily autonomy from them. And if they want to change the way that their body looks, like I will give them the hard facts about what the reality of that is, what the trade-offs are and also what to really expect. I'm I'm never going to sell someone on like, Hey, you're going to lose five pounds in three days. You're (laughs) going to have your fantasy body without really having to work out with, you know, and on top of that, if them coming to me for help to lose weight, to look a certain way, and then getting information on how to build muscle and make sure they're eating enough micronutrients, like, man, that's a win. That's a win for me because I know that the reality is that my journey started with wanting to lose weight. And it doesn't really matter where anybody is on their journey in terms of if they're still at that phase or not. Um, I would rather them come to me for help than to go somewhere else that's looking for like fucking a detox or a fast or like uh, intermittent uh, fasting or keto or, you know, like anything extreme. I'm just like, oh God. So yeah, yes, it has been interesting to be super, hey, you don't need to track if you don't want to. Hey, you don't have to weigh yourself if you don't want to. But there are also healthy ways to do that. And the problem that you probably face with the diet culture movement is that there is no nuance. It's very much like all dieting is bad and going to the doctor's office and having them tell you your BMI is bad. And and it's like, well, actually, some of those things are necessary and are useful. It's just that the context and the advice and the help and the some of it's probably been done in a way that wasn't very considerate of people or didn't have enough. I don't know, didn't take into consideration some of the context so or, or mental health of people. So yeah, it, it's certainly been something that seems like it's at odds with one another, but there are better ways to lose weight. There are better ways to do it in terms of uh, your mindset and your mentality around losing weight. Uh, and there are ways to do it without being completely sucked into diet culture and thinking that you can only eat clean foods and you can't have sugar mm-hmm. and you can't eat these. And so I, I guess that's the the thing that I'm trying to do. It's almost... It's almost like if if the bait is losing weight and you come out of it with feeling good about the way you look <laughs> with with paying attention to your health, you know, not losing weight at the cost of your health, whether that's physical or, or mental, um, and maybe even leaning towards performance. Like I want to gain muscle. Yeah. I want to be faster in my CrossFit workouts. Then that's extraordinary. That's great. Because I understand that if I, if I, and look, there are still people out there that are doing it, you know, people that are just helping people eat intuitively or not binge eat or not diet, you know, like there's like real anti-diet movement, the fuck it diet type thing. Yeah. Like that can absolutely work. Um, But I just think you ultimately end up shaming people that do want to change the way their body looks, even if they do want to do it healthy, like they don't want to be extreme. So I think <laughs> at the danger of um saying something negative about the anti-diet culture people, I think you end up shaming people either way. And I'd really like to just remove the shame and be like, hey, how do I? And that's why like one of my big systems in terms of the way that I coach is the Venn diagram of performance, health, and aesthetics. There is a crossover. I'm not going to ever let anyone come to me and go go after their aesthetics goals at the cost of performance and health. Yeah. In the same way that I'm not going to let someone go after their performance goals at the cost of health or aesthetics. There is a really nice little intersection, which technically forces you to compromise a little bit on everything. You can't get so skinny and lean and shredded that you lose your period because that's important to me. And yeah. I will not allow that. Absolutely. But you're also not going to be intuitive eating and eating out of control and gaining weight and suddenly being like insulin resistant or having issues with blood sugar, some, you know, some kind of health metric being off. So yeah. I think the thing is, is more about, hey, how do I get the best of all of those worlds um, and optimize, yeah, health, performance 
and aesthetics rather than just one and saying, well, fuck diets or just the other and saying, well, um, fuck health. You know, like it's, it's just like, there's gotta be something in the middle. And that's what I'm striving to find. Uh, and I look, I just want to take a second to very publicly speak to that because as you know, I just finished 12 weeks with one of your coaches through CFK nutrition, um, coach Steph, shout out Steph. Ah, She's amazing. She's amazing. She is amazing. (laughs) One of the senior coaches. And I had conversations with girlfriends as someone who does work in joyful movement. So I'm working with a lot of women who are either returning to movement after a really long period away from it, or women who have actually never felt confident to move their body. So they've always been, so we're doing a lot of intuitive stuff, a lot of ground-based work, all of those kinds of things. Um, And I also work probably in the intuitive eating space to an extent, though that's not my expertise or my forte or something that I really focus on. I would tend to refer. And now I'd be referring people to you because I had to go through that reconciliation between how can I be preaching that I want to love myself and accept myself the way that I am and... I'm going to hire this nutrition coach. Now, what came out of it for me, my feedback almost every week from stuff was eat more, eat more, eat more, eat more. <laughs> so I made it really clear to Steph in the beginning that the the number on the scale is of very little interest to me. Um, but I signed up to work with Steph one-on-one after I attended one of your launch pads. And there was a line that I have been saying to, I don't even know, probably hundreds of people I've said this to since it was there about There is a balance between deprivation and discipline and carelessness and indulgence. Because that has Mm. been my history with both movement and with eating for most of my life. From the time that I was very, very young, it was either, you know, here or it was over there. And certainly during the lockdowns here in Victoria, it swung to the careless and indulgent for a very long period of time. I don't regret that. That that was very much self-preservation for me, but there were consequences. My hormones were fucked. I was not sleeping. I was relying on alcohol in a way that I had not relied on alcohol in a long time. I had 10 years of sobriety in my 20s and I was right at that precipice of like, oh, here comes this slippery slope again. So I've cut that out, you know, recalibrated that relationship. And having stuff there to be accountable but more so than that to really like i don't think i don't think we ever talked about food really mm. other than like you know what are some what are quick protein sources that are not this or are not that you know like things that fit in well with my family most of the time we talked about my feelings most of the time what we actually talked about was the fact that committing to the 12 weeks with her was a real act of self love uh and she just happened I say that, but as someone who is quite woo-woo, I know that it was not just a coincidence. Steph was with me during probably some of the hardest weeks of my life in recent years. It has been an extremely challenging time. And to have her feedback and her support and her hand-holding through that. Now, has the number on the scale shifted? Yeah, a little bit. Not a whole lot. Can I lift again? Yeah. Do my joints feel great? Yeah. Am I hiking? I did a 60 kilometer hike last weekend. Am I sleeping through the night? Yeah. Am I, is my period regular again? Yes. Is it, you know, so I'm looking at those health metrics and I think that where I see you occupying such an important space in the CrossFit culture is that, you know, anyone who's been to CrossFit and you look, you look at the pyramid and you've got nutrition and there's the recovery and there's the movement. And there's so many people who do CrossFit Obviously, this is very, very different box to box. It's very different depending who your coach is and who you're working with, who go and they train like elite athletes. They do not eat like an elite athlete. They do not sleep. They're not recovering. They're not supplementing, you know, all of those kinds of things. And there is that trade-off of performance for longevity. And there can be a trade-off of aesthetics for longevity. And where I felt your nutrition coaching, this is not a paid ad, anyone, by the way, I'm not being sponsored to say any of this, <laughs> but for people who are in this space where I am, where they know they need some help, but again, really terrified to hire someone because I had such a traumatic history of detoxes and cleanses and Michelle Bridges, and I probably shouldn't have said her name out loud, but whatever. Um, and these, you know, 1200 calorie a day plans. Ugh, it was so refreshing. Yeah. I think a lot of people who find themselves in a bit of a weird space where they're like, well, I'm not an athlete. I don't want to lose weight. 
I even just had a client who has finished 12 weeks um, or she might've even been about 13 weeks and she's like, oh, I'm, I'm actually pregnant. So I think I'll wrap <laughs> things up. And I'm like, well, hang on. Like we just seem to have disconnected eating for health from all of those other things. Like it's just, it's just like you either have a goal of losing weight or being a fucking games athlete or something like, and it's like, if that's in absence of one of those goals, people don't feel like they're even entitled to have coaching. It doesn't, it doesn't often make sense. Like you said, they don't deserve it. It's, it's, it's not even, it's not even worth it in a lot of people's brains. Um, which, you know, and maybe that's a fault of my own with regards to the messaging, but I would love everybody to come and do three months, six months, fucking make it a year of just learning how they respond to challenging scenarios and what that does to their eating and their long-term health, because that's really where the benefit is in the program. Um, and I say it needs to be longer because you just need time for shit to come up. Like you just need time to see what happens. <laughs> I say it a lot. It's not the good days that matter. Like it's not, it's not how you eat, you know, Monday to Thursday on a typical working day, you've got a bit of a schedule, you've got your routine and it's not how you eat when it's normal, normal phase of your life. It's when you've been away three weekends in a row. It's when Christmas is coming and the holidays are coming up. It's when you've had a breakup. It's when you've got some health issues that you weren't expecting. It's when your mom gets sick. It's when like your partner and you've had a fight and you're not talking for three days. It's like, what's happening in those moments? Because oftentimes food becomes the way that we deal with emotion. And that can be the make or break in terms of your health which is wild. You know, it's like, we're just reacting to stress. We're just like these animals responding (laughs) to the environment. And suddenly like, you know, the way that we eat or the way that we treat our bodies and the lifestyle that we lead will totally flip. Um, So what we often find is that the value in the coaching is not in that we can help people lose weight or gain muscle or become more competitive or pick the right supplements to take. It's that we can help you figure out what you need on the bad days because yeah. oftentimes what you're doing on the bad days is not what you need. It's what you want to try and address the negative of, of emotions and the negative feelings. And you react by trying to numb out, trying to avoid, trying to deflect, trying to get some kind of dopamine from somewhere. And a lot of the time food gives you that really quick. So yeah, in just going through shit times, right? You know, you said you went through some really brutal weeks. And I think we we literally call it a rough patch. We call it a rough patch because it has to happen. And that's part of the reason that we expect people to do at least 12 weeks with us. It's the minimum period to sign up. Cause I'm like, I need you to go through something bad. <laughs> it's I bizarre. went through like it 12 strange. weeks of bad shit. Like, like you can ask Steph, it was a lot. So I was like, you had yeah, ample like opportunity. Yeah. I really did. I, just, yeah. I did the accelerated program. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so it's like, I need, I actually need you to go through a rough patch because then, then we get to practice your rough patch recovery. And that is super important for everybody. Um, One, it's like you figure out how to regulate your central nervous system and how to respond to stress in a way that fits your values and your goals better Um, and how to come out of those situations a little faster than what you would do on your own. Because a lot of the time we figure it out on our own. It can just take months instead of weeks or weeks instead of days. So, you know, the fight that you've had with your partner and you haven't been talking to them for three days, the way that you react to that on your own might be a little bit different to when you have someone who's like, Hey, just by the way, you still need to eat or Hey, just by the way, I know you're eating a lot of chocolate right now. Have you had any protein today? You know, it's like little things like that. Uh, And I know that I'm talking about like very um, specific, like eating types of food. And a lot of the time what we're actually going to ask you is like, Hey, I know you've got a lot on your mind right now. I know that you're probably feeling a little bit overwhelmed emotionally. Um, Can you just sit and just think about what choices you're making and just think about them. Just be aware of them. Just be aware of them. If you're feeling like you've got negative emotion and you're trying to run away from them, can you just sit for a second and just be still and we'll catch up in a week and we'll talk about it. You know, it's like, it's that, that's kind of the real process. And and you said it, you're like, we didn't really talk about food. We talked a lot about feelings, you know, like you're yeah. kind of doing it, talking about that stuff. Cause that's when it's not the good days, it's the bad days. And what the context of us eating like shit is not often the food. The food is not often the real problem. The food is the symptom of the underlying problem, which is any, any number of things. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff that comes up when you're, when you're really willing to be vulnerable in that process um, and really like dig into those rough patches. Yep. Yeah. And I did have to be vulnerable and I fucking hated it. So, I mean, that's my (laughs) job. Like people pay me to make them be vulnerable. So I get the benefit of that. But, um, you know, there was, there was one email she sent back where it was like, whoo, this week was tough, but you're tougher. 
And I was like, yeah, yeah. I fucking am, you know? And that's where <laughs> for me, I know my default. I'm a Taurus. So I'm stubborn. I'm bullheaded. You know, I can be like a dog with a bone, but I also can fall to those like sensual earthly pleasures, i.e. lay in bed all day and eat fucking chocolate. And that is my default to that complacency to the easy path at times. And so it was such, and it was also a really incredible opportunity for me as someone who considers herself quite recovered from years of disordered eating to see the shit that came up when I started to track. And I was mm -hmm. simply tracking for like volume, you know, which showed me I was drastically and dramatically under eating, especially when it came to protein, which I know is so important for mm -hmm. me personally. Um, well, for everyone, but like me, especially it was, it was something really lacking. Um, and I would find myself, you know, looking at my calories and going like, oh, I'm under calories. I could save my calories. And that's that Weight Watchers point system. Like how much was ingrained in me? And there was actually a really huge period of grief that came up for me around the years of my life that I gave away to attaching my self-worth mm -hmm to what I ate, what I look like. And I, uh, there's a podcast I listen to called maintenance phase, which is about the diet culture or anti-diet culture. And they go through different diets that have been popular. And I've tried pretty much every one of them. Um, and mm -hmm. listening to it makes me really sad for that girl who just thought she was such a shit of a person. If she, you know, didn't only eat grapefruit for two weeks, like just absolutely bizarre. Um, and to be having these conversations so publicly and to be honest with people about the fact that this is not something you get over and then you're healthy. It's this like daily commitment to showing up and being better. And like you said, thinking about our choices and actually being mm. very intentional in the life that we choose to live, which is what you have clearly done. I want to, I want to switch directions quickly because I'm conscious of the time. I could talk for like days about things like this because I find <laughs> it fascinating, but I want to talk to you about Gone Rogue because it is a podcast about non-monogamy, but I want to make it very clear to people that monogamous or not, there is a ton of interesting information. There's a lot of things to get you thinking about. Um, for me, there's been episodes that have really gotten me thinking about my connection to desire, sensuality, pleasure, which is something I think has been really lacking from conversations about women's wellness over the years. So from the time that you had MDM, whose real name I had to actually like mm -hmm. think about, it was like, cause I always still think of him as <laughs> yeah, MDM, no which for those who don't follow, Kate okay, stands for mystery date man. And he was, uh, his face was even blurred out and stuff at the beginning yeah. of your relationship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and how long have you guys been together now? And then when you decided to become really public, about the fact that you're in a non-monogamous relationship what was that thought process was it scary were you like fuck no let's do it like what how did that unfold for you yeah so for context I've always been monogamous um yep. my parents have always been monogamous like I have a fairly typical upbringing um so there's nothing that would have been like oh I've been experimenting with this for years like or even like being I bisexual grew up on a hippie like I'm like oh, I've been experimenting with my... yeah like I was yeah. I was wild in my youth and like no I was never like that I've always been a, a serial monogamous as Esther Perel would call it I've dated one person at a time and I had a couple of long-ish yeah. term relationships but they were less than a year so you know it was like I would kind of just date um and didn't really have a like hectic slut phase. Like I, I never yeah. really did that in university. I was always, uh, funnily enough, body image probably played a part in that. Um, and, and then some of my thinking around feelings and the relationships you have with your friends and, and relationships you have with people that you have sex with. Like I just had a lot of um, rules about that, um, which, you know, only have come out in the last few years for me, but uh, I had been dating in when I was like, it was actually beginning of the lockdown ish period. Um, even just before COVID hit. So I had kind of been dating and getting into these like little casual relationships with these guys and just not really feeling like it was hitting. And I'd, I'd, pre I'd come out of a 10 month relationship where, uh, I had been cheated on for, for like, kind of like the majority of the relationship. But it was bizarre because I, I had a really great relationship with this guy. He was super fine. I was totally like I'd fallen in love with him. And it was it was it was just 
unhealthy in ways that I didn't realize because he was lying about things going on and about, you know, his desires. And I didn't know. So it was something that I came out of being like, fuck, like I, I was totally blind to that. Someone just deceived me in a way that I didn't think it would happen. Um, and felt a little bit, almost a little bit jaded, but, um, yeah, I had kind of gone into dating and stuff and was like, yeah, I just, I don't know. Like I really like being single, but I also do like being infatuated with someone like, uh, maybe, you know, maybe I'm just not going to look for a relationship for a while because what I kind of established is, as I think a lot of women do when they're dating is like, it's either, or you're either dating to just like have casual sex. And it's just like, I don't even care what the guy's name is. Like, I don't even need to know who it is. My standards are zero, like whatever. Or you're dating for a relationship. Your standards are incredibly high. You withhold sex. You go through all of these, like, like this, this order of like milestones that have to be achieved. And you're trying to step onto the relationship escalator with someone. And it's like either, or and there's nothing in between. So I'd kind of been like, I guess I'd really just been dating for relationships for a long time, but if it became a casual thing, cause the other person didn't want a relationship, then I just would go along with that. So I kind of got to a point where I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit more intentional um, and just stay single and actually not look for a relationship. And I, I started talking to Greg MDM <laughs> and had kind of said, Hey, I'm not looking for a relationship. I'm just looking to make interesting connections with people and connections that I like, I'll, I'll invest more time in. And that's it. That's kind of all I'm looking for. And I, um, had just finished reading, uh, woman don't know you pretty by Florence Pugh. Oh I think God. her last name is Florence Gibbon. And, uh, oh my God. yeah, she's, she's, <laughs> she has, she says things that I don't agree with, um, yeah. and has views on things that I disagree with, but something that came out of that book for me was I kind of looked at my life and was like, you know what? if I was single forever, which had always terrified me, you know, I, I'd always made, always made jokes. Like I'm single AF. Like I'm so single. Like I'm always going to be single. And it was stuff cause, cause I was terrified of being single forever. I was like, Oh my God, am I broken? Is there something wrong with me? Why do, why is no one like me? And, um, I read a book and came away from it going like, you know what? I have a lot of really incredible connections in my life. Yeah. Friends, family, people that I've dated and, and people that I hook up with. And I'd kind of had some of these like kind of friends with benefits that had established a little bit like a guy that I dated like we would kind of hook up every now and again and he was still nice and I was like yeah like you know what I think I could actually see a really fulfilled life in absence of a significant other like in absence of that romanticized ideal of having your life partner and your soulmate and I think when I removed that I was like holy fuck <laughs> I think I've spent all of my life trying to fill this pretend void yeah. of needing a man. And I had missed all of the value that I could gain from the friendships that I had and the the relationships with my family and, and all these things that I, in a way that I was like, you know, you're so scared of dying alone. And I'm like, why? I would live such an incredible life yeah. if I didn't have a partner. I would live the most <laughs> incredible life. I have such amazing people in, in my world. I am surrounded by incredible mentors and coaches and training partners and BFFs and my brother and my parents. Like, you know, I, I, I love and adore all of the people in my life and I'm really lucky. So why on earth would I rob myself of that just because I don't have a boyfriend? Like it just, it was kind of like what you said around the body image, like the time that you spend yeah. trying to change the way you look, you're like, fuck, I've just robbed myself of that time. And I think I kind of had that where I was like, man, like I don't actually need it. Why am I so scared of dying alone? PS, we're all going to die alone anyway, even if you've yeah, been married. Exactly. Like we're all got done in a bed somewhere alone. Like, <laughs> I don't know. So I, I just, yeah, I had that kind of going through my brain, met, met Greg. Um, and of course hit it off, <laughs> like just hit it off with this guy. And I was like, oh my God, what? this guy's awesome. Um, and really early on, we talked about we talked about solo polyamory it was probably one of the first things that I brought up just as an interesting topic that I'd heard people talking about. Um, he was also a big fan of Esther Perel. And for those listening, she's a, oh, she's a psychologist. Love her. The, the pretty, I mean, she's at the forefront of relationships in absolutely this, in our current time. Like she yeah. is, yeah, kind of a fresher breath air. Um, so we bonded over her, her, who we actually met last weekend because she was speaking in Sydney, which was really, really cool. Um, and yeah, we just kind of decided that we would not adhere to the rules and sort of make our own. And I don't know if it was necessarily 
that we were, we met and we were like, okay, how are we going to do this relationship? It was just that we were talking about relationships in a totally different way. Like I was super interested in his previous relationships and then telling him about my past dating. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm really happy being single. And I'm also happy being in a infatuated in a relationship, but I also tend to lose myself a little bit. Um, and then when I'm single, like I can probably be a little bit hyper independent and not need anybody. And I'm a bit too tough around the edges sometimes. Um, so we were just super honest with each other. And early on he hooked up with someone and and uh, told me about it. He was like, I just saw a friend and he tells the story. Cause he goes, you know, I said, I caught up with a friend and caught myself on a lie and pulled, pulled back and was like, hang on, hang on. Actually, no, I, I hooked up with someone. And uh, my response was like, Oh, cool. Like, how was it? Like, was it great? Like, did you have fun? You know, <laughs> we had been dating yeah. for like maybe a week or something, not even dating. We were still just kind of talking at this point. We'd, we'd started seeing each other, like sleeping together, but that was it. It. so um you know I had no ownership over him and I never would want any kind of ownership or like he's not in my possession now because I've fucked him you know <laughs> yeah so I think that changed him around how he talked to me so yeah there was a degree of both of us were thinking about relationships a little bit differently um and then when we combined when we talked about things we got responses and reactions from the other person that was only possible because they were also thinking th about things differently um so, yeah, so I know that was a bit of a long story of how we kind of got together. But when we um, started dating, I, I started sharing about it on social media, just kind of naturally, like I'm going on a date tonight. That was where the Mr. Date Man thing came up. Um, and I didn't want to share who it was. Like, yeah, like I have a fa fair few followers and I was like, oh, like this guy doesn't need to be involved with that. Inundated so, um, by people. Yeah. I was like, ah, oh, you know, like, and I, I didn't know where it was going to go either. Like I'm not someone who like immediately is trying to post photos of someone I'm dating on social media. So I just kind of kept it a bit more low key and was sharing from my perspective a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I think it was just that I think the way that I share stuff on social media is a bit of a reflection of where I'm at, which is why, you know, I've shared about body image and I've shared about my intuitive eating versus my tracking and how I work with that and, and sharing about my period and sharing about how I balance training and intensity out with my stress and my hormones and, and my diet, like, and like whatever else I've gone through, it's just been a bit of a public, uh, event of me just like figuring it out. And so I was getting really excited about this new conversation I was having around relationships and my brain was kind of expanding with all these new structures and dynamics that I was becoming aware of. Um, and so that just kind of flowed into social media for me. Um, so there was, there were some things that I was like, I started talking about sex toys and sex. And that was probably when I was a bit like, I don't know how this is going to be, this is going to land. And I yeah. definitely had moments where I was like, I'm a little bit nervous about this, but I just, yeah, I just kind of was like in the same way that we talked about earlier with regards to CrossFit and adversity and seeking out hard stuff. I was like, you know what, this is just, this is just my truth and this is who I am. And this is how I would talk to a friend. So fuck it. This is how I'm going to be on social media. Um, and so that, yeah, that kind of set a standard for me to just be super open and uh, let me let you know, I've lost a lot of followers because people did not want that from CF Kate. Um, on Instagram. But then there have been a lot of people who have been like you have had really interesting conversations with and have gained stuff from it. And like you said, the podcast came about because Greg and I have an open relationship, but it it's stuff that if I were to become monogamous again, is all things I 100% would be using. Absolutely. You know? And to, I think that's where, um, you know, as someone who is in a monogamous relationship, I have, a, there's a lot of people that I follow on my socials who are in polyamorous relationships and that's just kind of how it's worked out. You know, there's certain, definitely certain themes amongst um, even certain movement modalities and things like that, where you kind of see these things happening. Um, and one of the, th and I've got a lot of girlfriends actually that over the last, probably last decade have explored having open relationships within the context of a monogamous uh, marriage kind of situation. Some of them I wouldn't even say they've ended badly. Some of them have gone really well. And some of them have helped the woman come to the realization that she actually doesn't want to be married to that dude, which is pretty valuable as well. The biggest benefit that I see in terms of the people I follow, yourself included, is the effort that's actually put into creating and maintaining lines of communication within a non-monogamous relationship. Because in a healthy non-monogamous relationship, from my perspective anyway, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong. There has to be a lot of checking in, you know, 
How do you feel about this? Is this okay with you? Whereas I don't think that exists in a lot of relationships full stop monogamous or not monogamous especially within marriages that have gone on for a long time there can be a real breakdown of that and so to me that's something that's been really beneficial um and also just connecting women to our right to have pleasure regardless of what our body looks like or you know um I attended a a sensuality retreat earlier this year and we all just walked around naked for the day and I've got a couple guests coming on this podcast who were part of that experience for me and it was just actually one of the most beautiful wholesome healing things because it was just all these women who were like fuck yeah I deserve to feel good you know um and so kudos to you for having that moment of going like hmm, I'm probably gonna lose followers but the reality of social media is like do you lose followers when you talk about period cups as well does that does that um I mean, that? I just lose followers all the time at this rate. Yeah. You, like, does it, does <laughs> it even thing, register like, to you though? Or do you care at all? Or are you like good riddance, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing with like having big goals. I'm like, look, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather do the thing that is more aligned with who I want to be in my values than to step back from that because I'm worried. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be the person that holds back because I'm worried about other people's feelings. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I, you still notice it, you know, like I still see when things, especially like quite dramatic changes. Um, but it's, it's kind of part of it. it comes with the territory and, and it's just something that you accept. Yeah. Um, I think that's a pretty good place to start wrapping up because what you just said there about, you know, I think if, if people are lucky, women in particular, you reach a point in your life where your commitment to yourself becomes bigger than your commitment to anybody else. Um, And that's hard to do. It's harder to embody. It's hard to live. But you have very much made a practice of that. Um, And certainly, you know, the vulnerability with which you share on social media, please, if you don't follow Kate, um, regardless of whether or not you consider yourself to be an athlete, please go check out her social media because I guarantee you Uh, there will be nuggets of wisdom there that will help you on your way. The other thing that I really just want to acknowledge about you that I really love is that you kind of do all the things. And (laughs) that is, I mean, that's what this podcast is very much about. The a, a common theme amongst the guests is that people kind of felt like they tried this or they tried that or they tried this or they tried that. And then they got to this point in their life where they're like, I can actually do all of these things because I actually... I'm going to allow myself this complexity that sometimes women are told we shouldn't have, that we should, you know, keep a simple take on this role or that role, that kind of thing. And to have watched you over the last couple of years kind of step into all these different roles and not only step into them, but to fucking kill them and to do so well with the nutrition, with the programming has been really quite awesome to, to be a witness to. So if you were if you're talking to the people that are listening to this right now and they're listening to this and whether or not it's something directly that you've said or if they're just kind of thinking god you can hear your passion you can hear your commitment to what it is that you do in this life the purpose that you're bringing to the world right now what tip would you leave people with when they're kind of in that place where they're like oh i'm very dissatisfied it all seems so hard where the fuck do i go from here um I think something that I lean on a lot in terms of like, Hey, what's my, what's my North star? What's my compass? Um, especially when you're talking about all the things, you know, like not just relationships, but business and training and and every aspect of yourself. Uh, something that I've always leaned on and one of my little beliefs is that the purpose in life is to give life purpose. And mm. it just meant for me that I got to decide, like, it was really up to me. The purpose wasn't to find it. It wasn't out there somewhere. There wasn't just one. You just give yourself the purpose that you want, that you believe in, and it might fail <laughs> like badly, but that's okay. I think it's better to, again, try and fail than not try at all. So for me, everything I've done has been because I've chosen to do it because I've created that purpose in my life. And I had someone who actually responded to me when I talked about that and they were like, well, I get it, but you know, what if I feel like I have so many different options? Like I've got so many things that like could be a purpose for me. And I'm like, cool, pick pick the first one, do that for a while, then pick the next one. There's no limit. I think so much of our time is spent going, 
what am I capable of doing in terms of where are my limits and, and what, what do I have the right to do? And, you know, what's not for me? You know, the other thing I say all the time is it's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're fucking not. Like we're so scared of doing things because we think we're not good enough or we think we're not loud enough. We think we're not confident enough. We think we're not big enough or not think we're not, we don't have the brains. We're not intelligent enough. And it's like, no fucking bullshit. You're just, you're just scared. You're just scared. And the only way to learn to do stuff is to fucking do it and make mistakes along the way. So um, you create your purpose, you decide, and it's not that you're going to hold yourself back. It's that your fears and your self-limiting beliefs are going to hold you back. And the way to not let them hold you back is to recognize them when they come up. There's no way to stop them. The negative thoughts, the fears, the self-doubt, the hesitation, it will always come up is to see that and realize that part of finding your purpose and or creating your purpose and going down that path is that when you see those pop up, you just go, cool. That's, that's the test. Yeah. Literally that's the test. I don't get the hero's journey without being tested. So the adversity, the hard stuff, the rough patches, the self, like the, the negative thoughts, the challenging emotions, the fear, it's all just fear driven it is just the test. And every time it comes up, I have another test where I can prove myself. And if I can just fucking stay the course, hold fast, stay true, which I literally have tattooed on my arms, then I'm going to get there. And it might not, you know, fuck, it might not be the top of the mountain, but goddamn, I'm going to at least shoot for the moon and fall amongst the stars. So I think for me, it's like, hey, create your own purpose. It's not who you are. It's who you think you're not. And everything that's hard that comes up along the way is by design because you do not get to be the person you want to be without going through some shit. So when you see it, be like, okay, cool. This is the test. Let's scare up and go. Oh, Kate Gordon, chef's kiss. (laughs) I'm not going to say anything else after that, because that was fucking brilliant and sums it all up. Um, I'm a little emotional now. I'm like, yeah, (laughs) Yeah, get up, get up, cry, and then get it. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to get up, I'm going to cry, and then I'm going to go snatch. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much for being here with me today. This was a bit, um, just to embarrass myself, full vulnerability, this was a bit of a fangirl moment for you. And I was like, would you maybe think of me on my podcast? You were like, fuck yeah. I I know, I remember getting your message, it was so long, and I was like, yeah, that's cool. (laughs) You're like, oh my god. (laughs) <laughs> and again there's people that were on my like dream list that I sent them these random messages and everyone's like for sure because yeah cool as women who've gone through this everybody wants to share their story of what they've learned along the way because they know how fucking good it feels yeah to be living e- even with the challenge because of the challenge right we all know how good it feels to be living a life that is in alignment with mm. who we are and who we want to be So you certainly have inspired me. I know you will inspire everyone who listens to this episode. Um, Where can people find you? Where are the best places to follow along? Uh, See if Kate is my, is my Instagram. You'll find all the other Instagram handles there as well. My website's seeifkate.com. If you want to listen to me talk more and just listen to the sound of my voice in your (laughs) ear hole, uh, the Gone Rogue (laughs) podcast, that's kind of where I do my talking. And I highly recommend that. Like I said to everyone, monogamous or not monogamous, there is a lot of things there and things that will probably make you uncomfortable, which, you know, I'm here for. I think that's- uh, It gets very, very juicy. Yeah, it does get very, very, I get very, very juicy too when I listen to it. I was listening when I started that- when I started talking a lot more about sex, I was listening to the Call Call Her Daddy podcast. (laughs) So there's a little bit of that kind of vibe in it. That's such a good podcast. Oh my God. Yes, please go listen to that one as well. Um, (laughs) Thank you so much for your time. It has been an absolute pleasure and I will talk to you soon. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks.